This style seems wild. Wait before you treat me like a stepchild. Let me tell you why they got me on file. Cause they give you what you like. Come right and exact. I said it's the battle. So okay, where you at? Black or oh. renegade culture? Renegade culture in the building. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you know. Shout out to Chuck D. Yeah, yeah, big up to Public Enemy. Public Enemy, Griff, number one. Flav, one. Terminator X, Lord. One. One, one. one. Yeah, Flav be bugging, but shout out to him too. Anyway, <laughs> Renegade Coach is in the building. We're going to be dealing with some, some amazing shit today. Yeah, yeah, man, we got a highlight, high-powered show today. That's why I'm in the seat, you know what I'm saying? I see, man, you know what I'm saying? We had to put, put uh, Kamau on time out. Come we on, had to man. bring the Minister Hip Hop. So you know what I'm saying? Are. Minister Server in the building real so quick. So who are you? Let the people know. I am Kalanji Jamachanga, a.k.a. the riot star. Don't get it fucked up. I just look like this. All right. <laughs> and of course, transmitting live for the planet, I am Minister Server, along with... The Ed Doctor. What's good? And this is Jai High. Yeah. Okay, what's Jai the name of the show? Renegade hey, Culture. Bo, 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 bo. Renegade Coach is in the building. You Yo, know what man. I'm Listen, man. I'm, I'm glad to be here with you, bro. I'm happy to see you, man. High power guest tonight, man. I mean, y'all be coming up with the guests that's like bananas, bro. Hey, man. For like the first time in the history of hip hop, finally, Serving I came through with some hot shit. <laughs> oh! I mean, a couple weeks ago, he came through with his, his nephew, his niece, his third hey, cousin. Hey, listen. I believe in nepotism, man. I want my hip hop grandpa grind. Okay. But everybody going to be dope. But tonight, we're talking about some foundational shit, bro. We're definitely talking about some foundational you know shit. We're we talking about shit back to the 80s, man. Way back, we man. We're taking back to hip hop. Prior to it even being the anything called an industry, you know what I mean? True indeed. True indeed. Yeah. Yeah, we're man. taking it back to LQ. We're taking it back to WKCR. We man. taking it back to Strong City Strong Records. Strong City, we're talking you about that, man. You had to be in the Tri-City area to know what time was. was hey, happened. listen, only if you're in the Tri-City you even know what we're talking about. You're like, what are you talking about? Tri- Tri-State, no yeah. doubt, no doubt. New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, yes, for those that don't know. That's yeah. the real Tri-State. No doubt. So um, tonight, man, for those who don't know and underwear, you know what I'm saying, we have uh, three, uh, I-, I would say, hip-hop legends. No doubt. Because of the fact that, you know, their contribution to this jam has been uh, incredible, and it's been uh, you know necessary no when it comes to what it is we're doing. We had a whole lot of people on here. We had whole members lot. of uh, Public Enemy. Mm-hmm. We had uh, Last we had? Poets. The Last Poets. We had Arrested Development on here. Killer Mike. Yeah. Killer Mike. No doubt. We had a whole lot of hip hop artists. Whole lot of hip hop. Some new artists. Cy Rock. Cy Rock. Uh, we had John Robinson. John Robinson. And a whole lot of the folks. Lioness. Yes. Yeah. This cat right here. <laughs> you gotta get it in. Gotta get it in. Shout out to Server in. with his Word. nepotism. Come on now. But um, tonight we got uh, we got the Prime Minister Pete Nice in the Prime building. Minister. The third Prime base. Minister. Never sinister. We got who else? We got up in this joint. Yo, man, we got the architect up in the building. Not the architect. The architect up in the building. Paradise Gray. Oh my goodness. Paradise right. Gray's in the building. But I you know what? Nice. But you know what? We pulled the real ace out the hole. Now this next person, okay. he don't even do a lot of interviews. I so most know. people may not, they know his work, but they might not know him. Damn we got Rocky Picano. Oh my All goodness. Right. Come on now. Ladies and Come gentlemen. Come on, man. Listen, let me tell y'all something. For those of you that understand hip hop, this is a treat. And if you don't, it's a lesson. You know what I mean? And, yeah, and, and, so this is like an extended version of the hip hop story it's, almost. It's, it's funky lessons. Funky lessons. lessons. You know what I mean, y'all like how I did it. I'm nice like beans and rice. Come on, G, what time I, is it? Okay. You know what it is. <laughs> Shout out to, matter of fact, we're going to dedicate this show to Lamuma Carson, no who doubt. had a lot to do with uh, a couple of guests on here today. No doubt, no doubt. You know what I mean? So anyway, you listen to Renegade Culture, don't touch the motherfucking dial. We'll be right you know black. I mean? You know what it is. Bo, bo, bo. Black out. This is protected by the red, the, the black, black, and the green with, with the, the key. key. Renegade. Whoa, 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 whoa. I like the original version, but I don't want to offend nobody and shit. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know, we <laughs> we're in this, this old PCL right no, now. You know, you no already rise started. <laughs> What's up, Pete? No sissies. Right. <laughs> yeah. Word up. Yeah. Let Pete really Nice do it. Um, because it don't mean anything to do with sexual orientation. That's straight from the architect, you know what I mean? Break, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So they got to understand, break the, break it down for them, Dice. How come I don't have nothing to do with love? Why is that okay for us to still say, sissies? Because it's a challenge for black man to look himself in the mirror every day and to decide whether he's going to do the right thing that day or he's going to be a sissy. No Ooh, doubt. No, no. That's, come from the, that's come from the architect. Yeah. Yo. Anyway, we, we talking hip hop today. <laughs> and um, like I said, we definitely uh, 
honored to have you brothers on, man. It's a good day in hip hop, um, especially since this is a predominantly political show. You know what I mean? This is a show that you can find everything from the BLA, the Black Panther Party, the Young Lords, and you can go back to the Last Poets, all the way back up to, like I said, Killer Mike, Cyrox, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, yeah, yeah. First and foremost, we have you on here today. Why we got these brothers on here today, sir? Well, man, you, one thing that we want to, first of all, big up to the groundbreaking. We talked about it last week on Renegade Culture. Absolutely. The groundbreaking for the Universal Hip Hop Museum. First of all. No doubt. First of no all. Doubt. Big first, up with that. First of its kind. First of its kind. No doubt. No doubt. We've been man. waiting for this for a while. Man, we've been waiting for a while and been putting in work. And these three gentlemen that we have on here, man, are the are the ones that are making it happen. So we want to talk about that. But you know, even the process to get to where they are no is, a, is a tremendous process that we need to talk about their story so that people know. Because one of the things that we always have to do on Renegade Culture is to show how everything is political. It right. all comes together. True indeed. And hip hop, you know, with, with these three gentlemen that we have on the day, you'll see how it all weaves together. So with that being said, Rocky, what, what was the vision? How did this come about? So uh, it started, you know, about 10 years ago. Um, a group of real estate developers came to me. Uh, I was running the uh, Gauchos basketball program and they uh, had offered to help expand the Gauchos program to another part of the Bronx. The Gauchos is based in the Mott Haven section of the Bronx. And these real estate developers thought that by adding the Gauchos to their proposal, that they could probably win this Kingsbridge Armory uh, project that the city was uh, looking to uh, develop. Long, long story short, those developers that uh, that had asked me to partner with them for the Gauchos got disqualified, uh, but the elected yeah, officials wanted to keep us in the mix. So they asked me to team up with another real estate developer named Young Wu. And it was really Young Wu who came to me about a few months after we you know, started to work together said uh, that he wanted to add a music component to his project because he just thought that it would help him uh, win the Kingsbridge Armory. And uh, I, I said to him, if you're going to put a music com a project uh, in, your, in your development proposal, you should think about putting a, a, a hip hop museum. Mm. And he said, a hip hop museum sounds good, but he didn't know that I knew anything about hip hop. Right. Uh, because I was running a basketball program. He's like, How, what do you know about hip hop? So when, when I told him my background in hip hop, he was amazed. And that was the beginning of the journey. We, we ended up losing that uh, Kingsbridge Armory project, but we didn't give up. I didn't give up uh, because I saw how the community really got excited that it was possible to establish a hip hop museum in the Bronx and it's just amazing that one, you know, had never got to the point where it can actually start construction. There, there had been many attempts to uh, start a hip hop museum, but they all faltered for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I used that to my advantage, basically, because I, I just knew that if there was anyone that could get the job done, it would be me. Right. So I, I stood with it. Uh, it was a long process. Uh, the first person, one, one of the first persons that I reached out to uh, yeah, was a brother by, by the name of Gary Harris. And uh, Gary Harris was a record promoter, a lo longtime friend of Russell Simmons and Andrew Harrell. And it was really Gary that really gave me the, uh, the, the battery, the energy to keep it going. And I kept it going, and I brought on uh, Africa Bambada, Grandmaster Melly Mel, Grand Wizard Theodore, uh, Joe Conzo, Curtis Blow, Cutman LG, and Mickey Benson. Those are the founding members of the Universal Hip Hop Museum. Right. right. And then sh sh shortly after that, uh, I reached out to Brother Paradise Gray, uh, you know, because of his background in technology and music and, and, and politics. And I, I, I spoke to him about becoming a curator for the museum. And, and well, Paradise was pretty excited. And, and lo and behold, here we are 10 years later. 
and the the building is now getting ready to happen. Now that, that's that's dope. Now one thing, um, you know, when you say that you you know, uh, I, I hate to quote Drake, I'm the only one to get the job done. Um, <laughs> when you, you said you know you knew you could get the job done for the for the viewers because of the fact that a lot of folks don't know your history, they don't know about uh, Busy B, they don't know about your your partnership with DJ Jazzy J, um, with Strong City Records. Can you give us a little background on that? Because we know like masters, masters of ceremony, you, you guys were the first ones to sign Grand Puba from, from Brand Nubian or whatever. Can you give us a little background on your history? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'll even go back further than that because my, my, my music career that's, starts. That's cool DJ Rocky from, <laughs> from the riverboat, from the yeah. riverboat days. <laughs> cool. So uh, cool in DJ New Rocky. York City, my cousin was Pete DJ Jones. Whoa. And, and, and Pete DJ fact. Jones was one of the top mobile disc jockeys in all of New York City. Word. And he was the guy that, you know, got me into involved in the music business. I started as a teenage DJ at the Stardust Ballroom. And then from there, I became a club promoter promoting all over New York City. Uh, the Riverboat, Superstar Cafeteria, uh, Cork and Bottle, all, all different types of clubs. Yeah. And uh, I left DJing, I left the music business uh, in 1979 after, you know, spending a half a semester up at the University of Buffalo. I, I moved down to, to Texas to take a job in television. And I started to DJ in, in Houston, Texas uh, for, for many different nightclubs in Houston. And this was when Cats in Houston wasn't even mixing. They were just, you know, playing one record, stopping it, and playing another record. But here, here's a cat from New York that knew how to mix. So it was just fascinating, you know, for those people down in Texas. And then when I moved back to New York, I wa worked at WOR Television, uh, and I got back into DJing a little bit. But then I started my record company while I was working at Channel 9. Wow. Uh, but the first record wasn't even Strong City. It was on MLO Records with a partner of mine uh, named Milton LaCroix, who's now one of the top boxing managers in the country. Ooh, wow. uh, he and I started MLO Records, and our first group was Masters of Ceremony. Their record was called Crime, which was produced by a very young Teddy Riley. Wow. Uh, yeah. And uh, that was actually Teddy's first studio production, even before Kids at Work, and way before he did anything like Classical 2, Classical any two. of those groups, before Guy, any of that. Wow. Masters of Ceremony was Teddy Riley's very first record. Man, Teddy had to be like 10, what, what 10 years old, 12 years old? Seven. <laughs> he, 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 was, he was 15 years old. Wow. wow. I'm still stuck on WOR. I'm from Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Channel 9 was like, you know what I mean? That, mm. that was one of the main stations back then and whatnot, man. Yeah, so I, I used to be the technical director for New York Mets baseball when they were on Channel 9. Wow. When they won the World Series back in 1986. Uh, 86, yeah. Wow. Wow. How about wow. bowling for dollars? Bo <laughs> that, bowling for dollars, Joker's Wild. <laughs> yeah, Joker's Wild. Uh, the Joe Franklin show, Romper Room, all, Joe all Franklin, those crazy wow. shows that was on Channel 9. Wow, Man, that's some real history shit, yeah. Wow. Joe Franklin, I remember seeing, uh, uh, what, what, what was the group that, uh, the first hip hop group I saw on TV was on the Joe Franklin show. Um, we and, had the Beastie Boys on, on the Joe Franklin show. Yeah, they were on. Who was who that? Yes, F-R-E-S-H, Fresh, Fresh, Fresh. Oh, oh Fresh 3 MCs. Yes, yeah, yeah, I yeah. caught that live one time on Joe Franklin's. So, oh, yeah. word. Wow. That's, yeah. that, that's yeah, what's up. We, we had all, all type of characters on the Joe Franklin show. That's bananas. One of the most crazy shows of all time. Ever, ever. So yeah, so now nah, that, that, that's real dope. We want to, um, uh, so moving forward, uh, man, we got so much to talk about. Yeah, man. Pete Nice. We know what's up. We know that uh, a lot of folks know you from third, third base. base. Yeah. But before third base, uh, folks in the tri-state, like you said, know you from WKCR. Um, a lot of folks don't re don't know that one of your managers was Lamumba Carson, right? Which was Professor X from 
X-Clan. X-Clan. But also, even before that, people don't know that, you know, Pete was a basketball star as well. Word. You know what I'm saying? Pete, people don't know all, all the little. background. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 I, I, and to play ball I, up in, in the New York City schools, you have to have skills. So, Pete Nice, you know, there's so much that we could talk about. But give us a little bit about your background prior to third base. Word out. Well, really, my background actually is the tie-in to the museum connection with Paradise and with Rocky. Because mm-hmm. uh, when I started out in high school rhyming, you know, it was like 1985 area, and Jazzy from Whistle went to my high school, Bishop Ford. So, so that was kind of like our little cruise intro into the music business. We felt like, oh, we're getting tapes before they come out on Red Alert. And, you know, seeing Jazzy you know, be like our first friend who like made it. Me and a couple other guys, my man Keyway, my man Fresh Fred Buddha B, we started a little crew called Sinquan Nun. And Keyway's father was friends with Sonny Carson. And sure enough, Lumumba got wind of of us doing this little group together. And next thing you know, Lumumba's managing us. So at the time, you know, Lumumba was partners with Paradise who was starting to do his nights at the Latin Quarter. And they were doing a lot of stuff at other clubs in, in Brooklyn, Empire Inn, Empire Roller Rink. And we started to perform. So we'd get on a flyer here or there. So that was my that was really my start in the business. Like the first flyer I was on was at the Empire Inn with like Stetsasonic, Sparky D, Dana wow. Dane. So and that was through Lumumba. So I met Paradise at the Latin Quarter and at, at these events that we were doing with Lumumba. So Scratch Me Productions was really Lumumba, but Paradise was also a part of that, but he was doing so many other things with promoting all these different shows and parties. So that was like really my intro to, to the business. And that's how ultimately I got my radio show after that at WKCR, like you mentioned. And, you know, then me and Paradise become, you know, founding members of X-Clan and Third Base. Of course, Third Base and X-Clan had their own little beef throughout right. the different <laughs> years. And... You know, sure enough, after all these years that we're removed, me and Paradise reconnect, and he tells me that he's working on this project with Rocky. Wow. And, you know, Paradise, being the original collector of hip-hop, artifacts, and memorabilia, back from the days when he had his own tie-ins with Pete D.J. Jones like Rocky did, you know, Paradise was DJing with Pete D.J. Jones at Pete's Lounge, and he's on the flyer as a DJ in 1979, just the way Rocky's on flyers back from 76, 77, 78. I found a flyer the other day with Brothers Disco, Breakout, and Baron with cool DJ Rocky at Truman High School. Wow. December 15th, wow. 1978. So, you know, it all, it all comes full circle. It's weird with, like, the three of us, how everything connected. But Paradise asked me to be involved with the museum in terms of, you know, the curation team. And, you know, one thing led to another. And Rocky and Paradise were going to different events at Barclays Center, trying to get different hip-hop notables to get their support. Paradise was carrying around his boards and different artifacts to show off to basically, you know, drum up the interest. And that's, that's basically at the time that Paradise asked me to come on, met Rocky. I knew Rocky from back in the Strong City days. I mean, I actually used to think that Rocky was security at one point at, at, at LQ because he was so tall. So tall I mean, right. he was like next to Jazzy J and Jazzy J looked like a midget next to him. So, so like, you know, it, it just goes back to those memories of the Latin Quarter and taking it full circle to the museum where, you know, me and Paradise helped put together this exhibi- these exhibitions for Rocky and for the museum. And, you know, that's, that's just how it came full circle. Well, we're going we gonna to go to this quick break. We're going to... Um bring back Paradise. We know Paradise's history is bananas. Um, I interviewed him maybe like five, six years ago uh, uh, in regards to Larry Davis. Larry Davis. You know what I mean? One of, one of uh, the comrades. Shout out to Larry Davis. No doubt. And also, uh, you know, so much stuff in, around uh, LQ and uh, 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 Latin Quarters and, and X-Clan, so on and so forth. So um, you're checking out Renegade Culture. Yeah, yeah. We're only on Renegade Culture. Can you get this real motherfucking hip hop uh, from with a revolutionary fervor to it? Exactly, you know what I mean. Exactly. And, uh, and we and we got one of the dopest white boys in hip hop, who I still think is doper than Eminem. Anyway, right. we'll be right back at you in a minute. Right, Renegade culture. Renegade culture. Bo, bo, bo. Block out.
Chad, the renegade culture in the renegade building. Renegade culture. Holding it down. Yo, big up to my man, Kamal. You know I got you whenever you can't be here. But I'm telling you, bro, the fans, the people, I don't know, man. Kalanji and I, yo. The chemistry's there, brother. Come can't on, man. It. You know what I'm saying? Come on, I heard man. Kamal's doing a tour right now um, as an elder bar stunt double. He's still my <laughs> man and everything. Out there He's getting brother. it in, yo. Yeah, yeah. Say no to dope. We all good, though. Anyway. Uh, I am Kalanji Jamchenk alongside Minister Server. And we about to do what we do. We are here with uh, Rocky, uh, Pete Nice, and the architect Paradise Gray. Dice, what's good, man? How you feeling, man? Uh, I feel great, man. It, and it's wonderful. This is the first time that me, Pete, and Rocky was on together on a podcast. A word? Really? Renegade culture. Yeah. Does it again, man. And, Does it again. It's crazy that, like, Pete. Pete and Rocky said, you know, we're symbiotically, cre you know, connected from years and years ago. Because as Pete said, uh, uh, my first mentor in hip hop was Disco King Mario mm. in the Bronxdale mm. Project when I was seven years old. Mm. I was his record boy. Wow. But the second mentor I had was Pete DJ Jones, who had Pete's Lounge on 164th and Ogden Avenue. And I lived on 165th and Ogden Avenue. And I started out sweeping and mopping for Pete at Pete's Lounge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and but by the time I was 12 years old, I was rocking the turntables there. Wow. So you say you hip hop, you, know? you mean that? Man, you got yeah. And my, my other connection to Rocky is that I was an early record promoter also, and I worked the Masters of Ceremony record to radio and to the media <laughs> back then. And I also was the casting director for the sexy video. Yes, you were. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so I brought all the fly girls with me. Yes. <laughs> I bet you weren't complaining about that, John, oh. was you? That's why Van Silk showed up to that, that video shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so tell tell us about, I mean, you know, Man, I mean, the, the history's bananas. You know what I mean? You're straight out the BX. And we talk about, uh, you know, for folks who know you from X Clan and the Latin Quarters, can you get it? How'd you get involved in LQ? And how'd you get involved in the whole X Clan situation? Oh, okay, man. You skipped a whole lifetime of hip hop to get there. Well, please, please, please bring me back then. You know what I'm saying? I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, when I, I moved from the Bronxdale projects, I moved to an area called High Bridge, which is about 12 blocks from where we're currently building a museum at. Right. And in that community, you know, PDJ Jones, CC Howard, a DJ named Tony Rome, who was Kevin Child's father, mm -hmm. you know, um, and a, a DJ named uh, the Grand Imperial DJ JC, who was the number one DJ for Herc and the Herculoids at one point. Wow. You know, all those guys was in that community. Real history. And we had live bands that came out and played in the streets before hip hop. Wow. And the number one band that would come out and rock it in my community was a band named Tuff, T U F F. And the lead uh, guitar player and singer of that group was a gentleman named Jimmy Morgan. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Morgan taught me how to do sound for a, a band. And I also used to watch his son while they practiced and when they went on the road. And his son is named Tracy Morgan. Wow. wow. <laughs> you, you know, it's crazy. I, I, worked, I worked with Tracy Morgan back in the 90s. I used to do comedy promotions and whatnot when, when, when Tracy was fat, when he was at Uptown <laughs> Comedy Club. So shout out to Tracy. It's crazy with the whole, uh, yep. the whole come around. Yeah, man. That's, that's bananas right yes, there. Yes, sir. So also from my hood, I got to do some shout outs. A Boogie with the Hoodie. Okay. You know, with the uh, hoodie. Cardi B, Big Bank Hank, All Debbie right. D, uh, Kid Z, Crazy Kev, and DJ Playboy, who was my DJ when I was with Paradise and the Brothers 3MCs. And then I was with a group called the Throwdown Four. Wow. You know, so uh, who wound up, members of the Throwdown Four wound up becoming the singing group Four by Four. And they had a hit record called Come Over. Wow. You know what? Uh, produced by Ready for the World. You know Ready what? Uh, both of y'all talked about um, some, some pioneer DJs that people haven't heard about. Pete, DJ Jones, and uh, Disco King Mario. Talk a little bit, Rocky and, and, and Dice 
and, and, and Pete. Talk a little bit about them because those are names that need to be heard more. Just give us a little bit of background about both of those two DJs. Well, Pratt, you, 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 you give your perspective there and then I'll talk about mine. Okay, well, we can't go with two of them, just like uh, the, the second, the first generation of hip hop DJs that play break beats is a trinity. So is the original. The trinity is Grandmaster Flowers. Oh, DJ Grandmaster Jones Flowers. and Disco King Mario. Grandmaster now, now, Flowers, wow. Grandmaster Flowers was the first Grandmaster of hip hop. Mm -hmm. And he hailed from Brooklyn. He rocked with Maboya and Plummer and Cool DJ D who wound up coming to the Soundview area and putting Mario on. So we right. got it when we talk hip hop in those early DJs, we got to start with Grandmaster Flowers who in 1968 mm. opened for James Brown at Yankee Stadium. Wow. You know, Crazy, yo. Flowers used to DJ in Brooklyn and have 50 to 100,000 people in attendance. And while he wasn't a cutting and scratching DJ like it wound up turning into, he laid the foundations of playing uh, original stuff like Soul Makosa before the radio stations and really taking disco music to the new heights that it, it went to, like breaking love is the message mm. and, and such. And then when it went to Pete DJ Jones, Pete was a bad dude on the turntables, man. Like I said, these guys, uh, they rocked what was called disco at the time. But there was a difference between black disco and white disco back right. then. You know, <clears throat> Pete DJ Jones and Flowers in them, they would play like McFadden and Whitehead, Diana mm. Ross, Michael Jackson, the Ohio Players, you know what I mean? Uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, you Back know? Back all of those, those, those jam rockers where at the early days of hip hop, we all played those records. Exactly. And if you look at old school flyers, you won't find the name hip hop on flyers before 1979, but you'll find the word disco on the flyers all the time. So right. we were too young to get into discos and we couldn't really go in Peach Lounge on a Friday or Saturday night. It wasn't no Adidas and no Pumas and no Tangos or Cazellis. Hip hop back then, in the beginnings, when Pete DJ Jones was mentoring Hollywood, Curtis Blow, mm. Lovebug Starsky, and Grandmaster wow. Flash, you had to have on silk shirts. You know, uh, you might have to wear a hat to get in the club and slippery shoes, you know? So hip hop yeah. came from that, you know? And um, the word disco throws people off. But you better know that the disco fever did not play disco all night. That they were birthing the culture of hip hop. Word. That's, that's dope. That's man. crazy. Shout out to Love Bug yep. Starsky, yeah. Rising Power. You know what I'm saying? I used to do promotions with him out in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Yep. But yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, big, Rocky. Big up so, to Love Bug. Yes, yes. So I'm gonna throw the oop to I'm gonna throw the oop to my big man Rocky. No doubt. Yeah. So uh, f flowers and. and Pete were both good friends of mine. The difference between those two was Flowers was, in my opinion, one of the best mixers of all time. Period. He, when when he's played records, you can even you can even tell the change when he went from one record to the next mm. because he was so precise with his mixing. Uh, Pete was the master of sound, and Pete's sound system was so clear and so uh, powerful, and, and that's what I really got out of Pete was not only his uh, ability to program uh, the best music all night and introduce new music to people, but his sound was just so clear. And then with his MCs, KC the Prince of Soul and JJ the Disco King, it, it really opened up the door for call and response. The you know the first the first entree to you know what later became uh, rap. You know you know the rap call and response really came from those guys in the disco clubs, just, you know, saying, you know, you know, just, you know, letting people know that they're in the building kind of right. thing. And what, what I got from Pete was just the importance of having good sound systems. Uh, the, the, the mobile sound system was such a, a big part of the growth and evolution of hip hop because that, that's where the battling came in at. The bigger the sound system, the more powerful your MCs would, would be presented. 
Mm. And if your sound system was whack, get to the back. Okay. <laughs> it was basically your, your, your night. You know what okay. I'm saying? So, so, so both of those guys, like Paradise said, we owe a lot of credit to because uh, although they were, you know, labeled disco DJs, the music that they played was not like uh, Paradise said, the traditional Donna Summers, Giorgio Marauder, and you know that that kind of stuff. It was really James Brown, yep. Jimmy Caster, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, Cool in the Gang, yep. uh, Archie Bell and the Drells. Anything with soul and funk in it. Yeah, McFadden and Whitehead. Word, word. So it's absolutely I, rock. Yeah. So I'm 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 gonna rewind again since we we going through this. this I mean, the history is crazy. It's like this could be a a, a twelve part series and whatnot. <laughs> but um, uh, I wanna I wanna get into uh, like I said, I wanna touch on <laughs> the whole X Clan piece, and then I wanna get into third base because we got uh. I mean, so much to talk about in so little time, but um, I think it's very important for for the hip hop heads. Uh, X Clan, the formation. How did how did that right. come about? Also, say that again. I said the formation, X Clan. How did that come about? As far as Black Box, well, X Clan, uh, um, that whole thing. Okay, well, uh, I was working at Latin Quarters, and um, Professor X uh, came to the club because. Heidi Smith from Rush Productions had sent them to come see me because he was trying to get groups to perform at fundraisers for uh, events that Sonny Carson and the elders were doing in Brooklyn. And Heidi told him he should come see me because uh, he couldn't afford to run the MC Houdini Curtis Blow. That Paradise had a new generation of new artists that he was working with would probably be happy to take the opportunity to perform. And she was right. So Lamumba met me at Latin Quarters and we became good friends. He started hanging out at the club with me. Sugar Shaft would come to Latin Quarters with Red Alert. He was down with Chris Lighty and the Violators. And they would carry Red Alert's records from Kiss FM to the Latin Quarters and set up and be his security and everything, you know? So uh, one night, me and Sugar Shaft was on the same train to Brooklyn and realized that we lived right around the corner from each other. Wow. So he stopped coming to the club with Red Alert and the Violators, and he started rolling the Latin quarters with me. And as time went on, he uh, let me know that he had a good friend named Brother Jay that was good at rhyming and, and DJing and everything. And uh, he brought Brother Jay on. So Brother Jay, Sugar Shaft, and PXO used to helped me with security and helped me with promotions at the clubs, pass out flyers, you know, whatever I needed, they were there to help me. And as when Latin Quarter closed down, we started running a club called The World in Alphabet City in Manhattan. And, you know, we started developing the Black Watch movement and X-Clan because it was hard to get, you know, Public Enemy and KRS-One and the other conscious MCs to come and do all these free shows at these rallies in the community. Right. You know, they were working on their career and it was, you know, they were becoming big stars. It was time for them to go make money. So right. we had a need and we filled the need ourselves. And we started doing shows and translating the the um the knowledge, wisdom and understanding of our elders and ancestors and into our music. Right. True indeed. So uh Pete, you know, um you know as a as a young artist at the Latin Quarter, talk about you know how how was it to be at the Latin Quarter and what did it mean to artists at, at at that time to actually be able to perform at the Latin Quarter the way that the crowd responded. Talk to the people about the kind of impact of the Latin Quarter from an artist perspective. Oh man, you know like my first night at the Latin Quarter, I came with Lamum. And you know how in uh, Daddy O's Stetsasonic Jam, I chilled with Walter and Lumumba in the Aerostar. So I, I ended up riding in the Aerostar with these guys <laughs> to the LQ. First night I went there, Stetsasonic was performing. Next thing you know, I'm backstage with Stet, talking to Delight, talking to the guys. And I'm saying to Delight, yo, where are you going after this? And he's like, oh, man, I got to get to work in the morning. And like at this point, they got Ghost Stetsa out. And I'm like, 
it, it was just like a wake up call. I hear uh, like our heroes, and they're working at nine to five as well as doing the music in Stetsasonic, hip hop's band. So it was like a wake up call to say, hey, you know, this is hip hop, but hip hop's at a level right now where, you know, it's not the Michael Jacksons. It's not, you know, this is like a grassroots type thing, and that's what the Latin Quarter was. It was like uh, the gestation of all these different up and coming artists that Paradise had, you know, I mean, he had the vision to see, you know, the classical twos, the Just Ices, the Positive Ks, the King Sons, and that, those were the groups that Lumumba was actually starting to manage and starting to starting to mess with Daddy O and like managing Stets to Sonic on the side. So, you know, when you see the crowds at the LQ, I mean, when 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 Paradise had PE come in for their first like Def Jam showcase right after they first started and were just on the road, I think with the Beastie Boys for a couple of uh, uh, shows, DE had their first show there and you know, they didn't even, you know, the, the crowd at the LQ was tough. You know, you had to have that hot record, you know, like like when Paradise discovered, you know, Milk is Chillin, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Audio 2, that record was born at the Latin Quarter through Paradise. Mm, so right. when you hit, had one of those records, you know, have Red hit that record on the turntables, people would go nuts. And that led to, uh, you know, even PE with Rebel Without a Pause. Right. So it, it was the place where records broke. And, you know, Red would break them on the radio and they'd be broken first, though, at the LQ. And, you know, Paradise was just so influential in, in you know, really catapulting all these artists to give them a showcase to you know, hone their skills on stage, and it was like the toughest place to play. I, I never even performed at the Latin Quarter coming up right there because you know wow. I wasn't in a group at the time. I I started to have my radio show, and was trying to get a record done with Lumumba. So we we me and Search actually didn't go back to the LQ after we were together in '88, right before the LQ closed. Wow. So you had the period from '85 where other people like Africa Islam was doing shows at the LQ. Yep. Or like a hip hop night, mm -hmm. and then Paradise had his first night with the Awesome Two in March of 1986, was a okay. big success. And then I think when me and Paradise figured out from the flyers, he had a, a farewell party for Curtis Blow in June of 1986 when wow. Curtis was going out to, to live in the West Coast. And that was the real night that Paradise really took the reins at the LQ. You know, formally where you know the, the owners said, "Listen, you take over Tuesday night." Celebrity Tuesdays. Okay. And, you know, that, that was the catapult for all the yep. artists. So, so we're going to take a break. And we, when we come back, we're going to start right there at that Celebrity Tuesday because one of the things that people need to know is not only was it uh, MCs, you know, you had like the Mike Tysons and the Chris Rocks and a bunch of people in the Latin course. So, we're going to start right there when we come right back with Renegade Culture. It's all about Renegade Culture, the building. Bo yes. Bo I came in the door. I said it before. I never, never let the mic magnetize me no more. But it's bite me. Fight me. Invite me. Rhyme. I can't hold it back. I'm looking for the line. Take it off my coat. Clear my throat. Time will be kicking in. Until I hit the last note. No oh. doubt. Right. Shout out to Rock Kim. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. Um, no doubt. I, I know he was going to choke search, but we ain't going to talk about that this episode. But anyway. <laughs> 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 anyway, Renegade Coach is back in the building. You know what I mean? We're here with Rocky. Pete Nice and Paradise. Paradise from X Clan. Paradise Lane. Yeah. Spark it up. You know what I mean? And Good you know said. this. Yes, indeed. Get their glaucoma correct with the motherfucking Cincy Million. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, yeah. we got a whole lot to talk about. Uh, I want I want to hop on Pete Nice. I know that uh, you know, he he managed folks like uh KMD, uh, Curious George. Um, and I know I'm forgetting about somebody. Um, help me out, help me out, help me out. Anyway. Also the main was Count Base D was, was another artist that we had later I, on. I don't even know how I'm going to forget Count Base D because we know Count Base Big D. Big up to Count so Base D. Count Base D. Salute. I'm tripping on exactly. that. I can't no doubt, believe that. No doubt. But anyway, um, exactly. third base, give, give us like a, a brief history of how that, how that all came about. And KMD, for folks who don't know KMD, this is where MF Doom got his start from as a Zev member Love of KMD. Rest in peace, Sub Rock and uh, uh, Zev Love X. That's right, that's right. So 
Give but, us a little yeah, background on that big, real quick. Big loss, lose, losing both Doom and Heem. But, you know, I, w- I was signed to Rush as a soloist, and, like, Paradise has his whole history of working with Rush with Russell. So I was in the group Sink One None. We, those, those guys went to school at Syracuse. I went to Columbia, so we kind of split up. And, you know, I was working with Lumumba. Then I actually ended up leaving Lumumba formed another group called the Servant Generals, where we would basically hang, hang out mostly at the Albee Square Mall with uh, my man Lord Scotch and my man Shamik. And then that group broke up, and I started to do my solo stuff. I got my radio show at WKCR, Columbia University, before Stretch and Babito. And I started to do my own demos and recorded some things in Funky Slice and Fulton Street in Brooklyn. And one thing led to another, and I you know, got a, got a demo tape to Dante Ross, who was working at Rush at the time, actually like road managing for Eric P and Rakim, working as Lior's assistant. And through that demo, I got signed just as a solo, you know, being managed by Rush. And Search was signed at the exact same time. And that's when the Beastie Boys were still on Def Jam and still on Rush. Mm. So Search was in the studio working on his stuff with Sam Sever. I was working on my stuff alone. The song Words of Wisdom was my main demo for Rush. Mm-hmm. So one thing led to another. We started hanging out together through Sam and through Dante. We hit it off, and then we had the idea to come up with, with the group Third Base, which was originally called Three the Hard Way, mm-hmm. but we couldn't use that name because of the movie and you know the rights. So we, we were together, you know, working at his third base trying to get a deal for like a year and a half. So most people think, oh, we were put together because the Beastie Boys, you know, left Def Jam. We were on Def Jam. We, we were on Rush, you know, for like a year and a half. Def Jam was actually a fallback because they were trying to get these big deals with us, with Arista and, mm-hmm. you know, Warner Brothers, all these big deals. Those fell through, and our fallback was Def Jam. So, you know, that's the greatest fallback in the world because that's where we wanted <laughs> to be from day one. So... <laughs> So, so, you know, here we are, we're coming out with our single on Def Jam, and, you know, while we were recording, our dancers, a med notice, were from Long Beach, Long Island. Search had been out in Long Beach because they used to have shows at the MLK Center with WBAU and Dr. Dre and Spectrum City, Chuck and everybody. And that's where he first met Doom, I believe. And then through Ahmed, we would hang out in Long Beach all the time, and Doom and Subrock had their little demo tape that they were working on. So we heard their stuff, thought it was incredible. And next thing you know, we were recording with Prince Paul doing a song called The Gas Face because Doom used to say the term, you know, gas and gas face. And that was created by one of their boys from Long Beach. So Doom took that to the next level. We got together, did the song pretty much, you know, uh, almost like we wrote the lyrics on the Long Island Railroad out to Island Media with Prince Paul dropped it immediately like spontaneously and you know next thing you know we had this big hit so through that you know doom was introduced to the public but then you know he had his own group with his brother kmd and you know through dante we were able to get them a deal at kmd so like we were able to like almost we weren't even trying to do as a company we were just like putting on our boys Mm -hmm. so you know one thing led to another and then you got you know us forming riff productions managing doom and his brother subrock and, I, and, you know, Onyx, the birth zone kid, who was the third member. So, you know, it was a great time to see them, you know, go off on their own. And, you know, the rest is history. So, so we don't, so we'll have to, we'll have to uh, believe MC Search version that he found you walking through Brooklyn one day. And uh, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, storytelling, storytelling is a great part of hip hop. You know, okay. what yeah. say about that. Hey, I got one and question. Boy, MC Search is the, the trunk of hip hop. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got He's known for telling the big lie. <laughs> well, I guess we won't hear no more third base albums. Is that what you're saying? I got one question. Nah, that's not going to happen. Pete. But, uh, but, uh, but that, that's why I say full circle with the museum. Like, like what we're really involved in is preserving the history. No doubt. The culture. And that's why even when, when Rocky and Paradise are talking about Disco King Mario and PTJ Jones and Cool D, I was a white kid living out in Queens and uh, Long Island growing up. I went, to, I went to high school in Brooklyn. And I got to learn about all these cats because I, you know, I wasn't in the Bronx back at the time when Paradise was sweeping the floors and DJing at 12 years old. So 
it's kind of like through the history and the flyers and talking to all these other pioneers that you learn about it. And that's the thing that I think is missing with a lot of kids now right. is that they don't know the history of hip hop. And okay, I think dudes. with 50 years of hip hop history, the fact that there isn't a brick and mortar museum is like a tragedy. So the fact that Rocky, you know, had this vision and to bring all these different people together and to have it formulate right now, I think it's going to do something you know, for the next generation. And I think that it'll give, breathe, breathe new life into all these forgotten pioneers who are so important to the development of hip hop. The Ed La Rocks, you know, the Africa Islams, the Disco King Marios, the Charlie Rocks, all the, all, the, all the innovators, all the people who made this what it is today and haven't really been fully recognized the way that they should. It's a blessing for us, man, because of the fact that we remember when there was only hip hop uh, on Hot 97 on Fridays, I mean, excuse me, Kiss on Fridays and BLS on Saturdays, oh, yeah. the Mr. Magic and Marley Mall joints and the right. uh, and Chuck Chill that, and... that, 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 that hip hop radio was so important because, you know, black radio didn't embrace it. And, you know, groups like Houdini were able to get on the radio first because they had more of that R&B sound. Right, and, right, and, exactly. You know, people like Red Alert, the Chuck Chillouts, right, Rocky? The Chuck Chillouts of the world just, uh, you know, made with Magic and with Marley and with Zulu Beats and with the Supreme Team right. awesome too. You know, all, all of those rap Lady shows. Lady B in Philadelphia. Yeah. No doubt. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Lady exactly. B, definitely. And, and you're going out to K-Day with Greg Mack in, in L.A. So all yeah. of the... The radio really brought it to the next level and solidified hip hop as, you know, a marketable entity that, you know, records could be sold and it became a business, which helped, you know, grow hip hop. Right. And don't forget my man, Tech and Sway. Yeah, yeah. exactly, Definitely. exactly. So, exactly. I think, uh, here, Doctor, had a question. Oh, I had a real quick question. Pete Nice, did you ever run into MC Hammer? And if you did, what happened? <laughs> we, we actually saw Hammer we were out on tour with Houdini before we even had records out. Just, ha you know, we, we were like judges in a celebrity uh, uh, basketball game with Full Force and uh, New Edition. And Hammer was doing a, a, a dance performance with a little kid at halftime. And Search was like, yo, I want to battle him. I want to battle him. So he actually went up to, to Hammer. And you know, said he wanted to battle, and Hammer looked at him like, who the hell is this kid? <laughs> who the hell is this white kid? And me, me and Serge were out, outside after, and uh, Hammer was driving out in his 560, you know, blue drop top with his bodyguard Dante, and we were like, yo, because Ham Hammer had been to New York at the LQ with the Holy Ghost Boys, the new music seminar, I think it was, right, Dice? The Holy yeah. Ghost and Boys. He got, and he got, like, booed off stage, so... But but at that time, Hammer had also this you know run so we you know run in D so we remembered that yeah and the whole the whole thing that happened with with uh, you know the Hammer part in the gas face was all spontaneous I just said it you know and then I had another line about Hammer so that that kicked that all off but after that we never saw him in person but we did get ambushed by Greg Mack on the radio at K Day so we had a whole argument back and forth with him after he won the American Music Awards, which is classic. I, I posted the tape. Greg Mack gave me the tape back then. So, but uh, that, that's pretty much the history there. So Search version was a lie then. Search said something about... Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, what Search said was just, was just ridiculous. And I had the tape, so I just gave, you know, put the tape out there and uh, just set, set that straight. No doubt. Let, let, let's talk about, um, real quick, um, we want to... Uh, I guess with uh, Paradise, talk about the connection between. Um, uh, well, you know, one thing that uh, Dice had talked about, it was kind of like a changing of the guard at the Latin Quarter, from like the right, old right, right, to right, the right. new. So, like, um, I mean, people people often talk about the uh, the KRS One Melly Mel kind of battle, and you know, the, the changing of the guard. So, you know, briefly, kind of tell us about how that you know the the the, the Latin Quarter kind of ushered in what we now call the Golden Age of Hip Hop. Okay, when I first went to Latin Quarters, uh, Melly Mel and Busy B were on, on stage uh, in, in doing a call and response on a Friday night. The first time I went to Latin Quarter on a Friday night, that's what I saw. Oh, cool. And uh, just a couple, like five more minutes. Go ahead. Yo, 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 yeah, yeah. Good, Dice, we good. 
My bad. Okay, so uh, it's all good. So um, uh, when I first started promoting at the Latin <coughs> Quarter, I was trying to get the big groups to come in and perform, and they were out doing big tours and big stadiums and stuff. So who were the big like groups? Out of, out of, who were the big groups? The, Run DMC, Houdini, Curtis Blow, the Fat Boys, you know, uh, I could get them to come hang out at the Latin Quarter, but I could never afford to put them on stage, you know what I mean? Uh, first of all, the club was really too small to even handle those groups, you know, for the crowd they would have brought in New York on the weekend. Right. So uh, I took all the, most of the groups that were performing during Celebrity Tuesdays and I started booking them on Friday and Saturday nights, giving them a bigger profile. You know, cats like Big Daddy Kane, Bismarck, Roxanne Shantae, Coogee Rap, Eric Van Rockham, Heavy D and the Boys, all of those groups. So crazy. Uh, a new younger group started coming to the club with a new sound. And the new sound was danceable hip hop, you know, because B boying. Pop locking and electric boogie had really played out in New York, especially in the club scene. So a new style of freestyle hip hop dancing was being born. And a lot of that was coming from the dancers that were dancing to house and club music. You know, mm. they weren't standing around the club in a b-boy stance. It's standing in one spot on the dance floor trying to look cool and posing. They were dancing their asses off. And they had flat tops and, and their, their eyebrows were cut, you know, <laughs> like their hairstyles had their names in the back of their head. And it was just a whole new style of look and uh, dancing. So the Latin Quarter became the champion of hip hop dancing, freestyle dancing. And um, it changed the whole industry. And everybody started making music so that the dancers at the LQ would run on the dance floor when their songs came on. Because guess what? If the, your song came on and the IOU and the JAC dancers didn't rush the dance floor, chances are Red Alert ain't playing your shit no more. Because <laughs> he want that club to rock. So everybody start making boom bap joints like BDP and Public Enemy and you know what I mean? And it it ushered in a new sound and a new style in hip hop and a whole new generation of rap stars were born. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah. But uh, after saying that, I just want to uh, quickly say this, because like I said, I rarely ever get a chance to be on with Rocky and Pete, but uh, man, uh, thank you so much, Rocky, man. You know what I'm saying? For having a vision and, you know, uh, allowing me to uh, recruit the team that we did, you know, our ace team, it's bananas. It's the best in the business. I love all y'all. And I also wanted to say something about Pete. Uh, you know, uh, me and Pete, we both started collecting with baseball cards and comic books when we were children. And our love of collecting that naturally led to us collecting hip hop flyers and posters and magazines because on hip hop flyers, it's like superheroes. Right. Grandmaster Flash, Grand Wizard Theodore. Grandmaster Melly Mel, Grandmaster Kaz, you know what I mean? It's just amazing. You know, uh, the Disco Twins, Infinity Machine, Chief you know, all of the amazing pioneers, Word. the four MCs, they sound like superheroes. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. they were accessible because you would see these ghetto superstars walking down the block and they would stop and do a cypher or spit a rhyme for you with no problem, you know? But uh, back to my man, Pete Nice, it's just wonderful that in the age of Trump, that X-Clan and third base will be able to find such an organic, true friendship. My mom died about four years ago, and the only person in hip hop that came to my door was Pete Nice. Wow. You know, it was unexpected, but he showed up at my door with two handful of hip hop memorabilia from his collection. Mm -hmm. And we wound up spending three days together going through each other's collections and, and realizing how important it was for us to collaborate on, on a book or something. And what began as a conversation on a book about Def Jam has now resulted in uh, one of the most incredible 
odd couple friendships in the history of hip hop. <laughs> and exactly. I started going blind over the last three years. Pete Nice has been my eyes and my hands, and it has allowed me to continue my work and to be the first blind chief curator that I've ever heard of. And <laughs> I just want to, from my heart, thank my brother from another mother, Pete Nice and, and Rocky Buchano for the hard work and dedication that y'all put into this museum. Because people, they, they see what happened on Thursday the 20th, but they don't see all the, the late nights that both of you guys and our whole team have put in three, four o'clock in the morning, you know, uh, sometimes banging our heads against the wall. And, and, and I love y'all guys, man. Thank you very much for helping me live out my dream. No doubt. As we wrap awesome. up, no as we doubt. wrap up, um, Rocky, yeah, exactly. Please. And you know, just want to say, your know, Paradise has such a positive attitude and his work ethic, and just the vision that he's brought to the museum is just incredible. And you know, bringing me in, nah. unbelievable. That's dope. Yeah, yeah. Rocky, real quick, for the people, um, tell us what's the plan uh, for the Hip Hop Museum. When do we expect it to open it? I know it's more than just the museum. Give us a quick rundown before we wrap up and tell us how people can support uh, our hip hop museum. So uh, before I even say that, I want to say much love to Paradise and Pete. Uh, these guys <coughs> really are the dynamic duo of curating the you know history of hip hop. Our current exhibit at the Bronx Terminal Market, everyone must come check it out. It's called The Revolution of Hip Hop. We're celebrating the years 1980 to 1985. Yeah. And it's one of the most, um, you know, most applauded, applauded uh, exhibits in hip hop. Everyone that comes in there loves what they see. So kudos to both Paradise and Pete for the work that they did uh, to produce that exhibit. Uh, the, the museum will open in 2024. It's going to be a 52,000 square foot state of the art uh, home for hip hop, celebrating the entire history from where it started back in the early 70s and even speaking about the early influences that led up to the birth of hip hop many years before that, up to where we are today, present day hip hop. So it's a combination of celebrating the past and the present and using the best technology to bring the story to life. Uh, so we're working with Microsoft as our main technology partner. MIT is our educational partner. We'll be working with other companies uh, in the very near future to include them. But the most important thing is we are celebrating, you know, uh, people who are still living today. So it's not a museum that is just uh, celebrating, you know, people who have deceased many of these icons and people that we're celebrating are still walking around this planet today. Mm -hmm. So uh, as Paradise would say, we're not a mausoleum. We are a museum that represents the living, breathing aspects of the five elements of hip hop. And that's what yeah. we have. Word up. Word well, up. We want to thank you all for coming on. While we there, I'd like to uh, thank Minister Server and the work that he's been doing with us at the Universal Hip Hop Museum including but not limited to his work with our education department. And uh, like Rocky reminded me, you know, we got a shovel coming down there to Atlanta that uh -huh. we're going to leave with Minister Server. And Minister Server is going to uh, share that love and the vision of the museum with all the incredible artists in the South. And we have not forgot y'all. Do not think that this is not your museum too. So Dungeon Family, T.I., uh, Luda and all the other new artists and everybody, we got y'all. We haven't forgotten about y'all. Your history is as important to hip hop as anyone else's, and we definitely will tell your stories. Yeah, and we're gonna use definitely. some of that, use that shovel to shovel some of this bullshit around here as well. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So get that up out the way, because that's how we do around these parts. Yeah, you know man. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. man. Man, diff man. Again, man. Thank y'all for coming on, uh, uh, Rocky. Uh, you know, um, y'all have an incredible team. Big up to uh, Martha Diaz and uh, Sinyan and you know all the people behind the scene. Renee, you know, all, uh, Michael Dean, Rich Nice, Master Fable. 
Pop Master Fable, yeah, you know, Master Fable. Curtis Definitely. Blow, you know, yeah. all the ones behind the scenes. For those that are watching this, go back and listen to Eli some of the Tupo. names. Without a doubt, listen to some of the names that these three Reggie men talk Peters. about. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> listen, as they, as they keep shouting out names, listen, we could have done this for three more hours, renegade yes. coaching. Nobody's doing it like y'all doing it, bro. Hey, you know like, what I'm saying? Like, like we doing yeah. it. I, 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 I want to like, <laughs> say, too, um, and I need to get in touch with this brother, Keith Klinkscales. His yeah. mother was my fourth grade teacher back in, uh, in, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And, um, you know, and, and his father, I know his father was a Harlem Globe trotter, so on and so forth. I'm glad to see that he's on board representing where we come from. You know what I mean? So definitely, you know, big up to the work you all are doing and also honoring people, like I said, like Lovebug Starsky, because of the fact that he gave me plenty of these goddamn gray hairs I got in my head. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I, he, Along with everybody else. Hey, I, I, got, I, got, I got a story I'm going to talk about one day about how I had to sneak out the club because of the fact that I was doing promotions and he gave Dougie Fresh the wrong date and we got a packed club. You know what I'm saying? And he like, I'm like, yo, what's up, man? I'm calling Dougie. He's like, yo, Kevin said it's next week. I'm like, yo, we got a, a packed house right now. <laughs> and, and, and Starsky, I go to him. I'm like, yo, man, um, what's, what's happening, man? Dude said you said it's next week. He said, that's all right, man. Tell him, love bug Starsky's in the house. I'm like, they about to kill me. I had to get snuck the fuck out the club, laying down like this and shit, so I wouldn't be laying down perfectly. So shout out to love bug Starsky. No doubt, no doubt, man. Up in the sky, up in the tree, who do you see? Starsky. Starsky. Who do you see? Hey, man, salute to y'all for real, bro. No doubt, man. We appreciate y'all, man. Stay on point. Stay on top of things. We're looking forward to the museum coming up. Opening up, and um, you know, much love, man. Y'all keep up that work. Make sure you go to you. uh, uhhhm.org to find out more information. Make your donations. This is our museum. We need that dough too. Word. No doubt. Y'all be safe, man. Salute. Salute. Cheers. Peace. Peace. Transmitting live from the planet Earth, I am Minister Server. It's time for your hip hop story. Yo, you know who this is? Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, the first group inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame from the hip hop community. And they made up the members of Grandmaster Flash, of course, Melly Mel, Kid Creole, Cowboy, Scorpio, and Raheem. Now, when they came on the scene, man, what was so dy dynamic about them is that their stage show, while you had other artists back during that time, Cold Crush, uh, Fantastic Fire Romantics, what was so different about Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five was Grandmaster Flash himself. He was probably the first real superstar in hip hop because he was the one that came with the techniques, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the showmanship of the show, not just mixing records, but actually performing. So during those days, again, the DJ had way more juice than the MC, but Melly Mel, who was none, known as one of the greatest of all times. You know, for me growing up, you know, hearing Melly Mel's rhymes, the rhyme that he did, the last rhyme in Beat Street, listen to that rhyme word for word, it's still one of the greatest rhymes ever. So when you think about, hip hop story. And you think about those that laid the foundation for all the groups that will come later on. Think about Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Word. Let's have the Renegade Coach in the building. Renegade Coach. We had an amazing show. Amazing show. Who did some of the people we had on there? Man, we had Rocky Buchanan, the executive director for the University of Hip Hop Museum. We had uh, uh, Paradise Gray, who's the chief curator uh -huh. for the University of Hip Hop Museum. And the co-curator, Pete Nice, Prime Minister Pete Nice. No doubt. So in essence, we had Strong City Records. Strong City Records. We had Third Base. Third Base. And X-Clan. And Black Watch. On the same goddamn show. On the same watch. And where Come we on at? Now. Renegade Culture. Who else does it like that? Act but us. No. Now, what we doing tonight, this is show like 116 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Episode 116. 116. And for the first time, we have our first International artists International outside of the states. Word. You know what I mean? Tonight, tonight, tonight. About time, man. I mean, because we're already global. I mean, you know, we, had to, on, save, we had to save this one for last. It's true I mean, not day, last true before, you know, later on in the joint. Save it for a real hip-hop show. You know what it is. A true hip-hop show. Act like you know. You know what I mean? This sister right here, she went from Ashy to Classy. No doubt. <laughs> She's out in Toronto. You know what I'm saying? Or Toronto. 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 Not Toronto. <laughs> yes. Toronto. Yes. Yeah. She's an Ethiopian artist. Yes. You know what I'm saying? We've been knowing her for a couple of decades. No doubt. And she's been putting in a lot of serious work. We want to give it up for our sister, Rahase. Rahase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, thank you. Man, y'all sounded like you was just dropping lyrics. Like, <laughs> that was a song right there. That's what we do. It's renegade culture. That's what yeah, we do around man. these parts. Yeah. 
Rahasa, for folks who are unaware, you know what I'm saying, there's maybe like two, three people on the planet uh, yeah. that, that never heard the name Rahasa. Tell us, um, tell us a little bit something, a little bit about who you are and, and, and where you come from. Um, you know, I'm Saudi born, uh, American raised in Saudi Arabia, and uh, my parents are Ethiopian and Eritrean, uh, specifically uh, Tigray region of Ethiopia and Eritrean. And um, I was raised in Saudi Arabia, and then my mom uh, moved to Atlanta, and I came as a teenager to Atlanta, and and wow, I mean the culture. The culture shock was, um, mm -hmm. I, I grew up around white people and then all of a sudden I'm immersed in blackness and it was beautiful. And I realized that people were afraid of what they don't know, mm -hmm. right? So me coming as an African, even though I didn't come straight from the continent, you know, my parents were from the continent, um, the misconceptions and perceptions that my classmates had of Africa, just it blew them away when they were introduced to me because they're like, you're not starving. You don't have these facial features. <laughs> How come your skin looks like that? Why do your hair look like that? And I was just, I couldn't believe it because I've seen, you know, Africans from the lightest of the light to the darkest of the dark and every type of everything. And I think everybody's beautiful. Like, I thought that was normal. I didn't know that um, people were uh, cultivated to think a certain way of what was acceptable and what was not and self-hate. And I've, I noticed it around my folks growing up but not so much. But then I really started to connect the dots when I was in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, they're actually like teaching us to hate each other so we never actually get together and exchange and really grow because what we have in the continent and what y'all have on the West side, if we actually brought that together, I think um, Marcus Garvey was pretty close on that. If we actually had a real cultural exchange, mm -hmm. I really believe that we could just blow all of this out the water. Okay. So I started using the arts um, to help to uh, bridge the gap between Africans in the world. I figured, you know what? Let me just show people my humanity. I'm down to earth. I'm just the sister next door who happens to be African, who happens to be of these um, different uh, uh, heritage. And I just, it, it, it kind of like took a life of its own. I became an unofficial ambassador of Ethiopia, even though I was learning about my roots through my songs, mm -hmm. people were kind of going on that journey with me and they were enjoying the fact that it was, um, it was accessible, right? So I would throw in some of my culture, I would throw in some of the language, but I would still do it in English because that's how I grew up. Like if I try to do everything in the language, I would sound fake because that's not how I grew up, you know? So I mixed in everything, mixed in different styles and I would start pulling in people depending on what style they liked out of my mixtape, that's the sort of audience that I would pull in. Mm -hmm. And then they would start getting introduced to everything else that I did. So that kind of took a life of its own. I was just trying to do a mixtape to take my ass back <laughs> to, um, to Ethiopia, but that never worked. I started getting booked all around underground in the States and that took a life of its own. I enjoyed it, especially um, the Pan-African route. I really enjoyed seeing people that understood the power of uh, black economics and, and the cultural exchange amongst each other, even though uh, four to 500 years of dispossession, there was still um, that stream of people that understood the strength of that. And I, I gravitated to that and sort of learned from that, just try to understand that and see how I could implement that because it was like a parallel lifestyle. Like I was experiencing pretty much what people were experiencing, but parallel, it wasn't exactly like you, but it still was because as an African, I wasn't even considered three fifths of a man. You right, know what I mean? Right. So it was it was pretty rough, even though I had I had come from um, a pretty uh, uh, you know upper middle class family and a good background and stuff. All of that shit didn't even matter. Mm. You know? Let me it ask you this. Matter. Now yeah. we, we know that, uh, and, and I apologize because of the fact that we don't have a whole lot of time, but we got a lot of shit yeah. to get into in that time. No worries. That's just a nutshell of, of how I got into the arts. No <laughs> doubt. So so like right now we were talking earlier, it's a lot of unrest going on in uh Ethiopia. Can you uh speak on that a little bit as far as how that's Yeah, um yeah. Uh so my parents uh ran away from um the red terror that was communist backed um that overthrew the emperor and they were also annihilating my mother's people as well as my father's people. They were just across the board, right? Um, so in that happening and then come a full circle to this thing happening now, I, I was there 
in 2018 when the border opened again, right? Mm. And I thought it was weird that after 30 years of unrest between these two countries, all of a sudden they're best friends overnight and they're having all of this parade on TV. I was like, man, something's up, you know? Right, right. That was just me. I was like, it must be the waters. It must be the the West wanting something that they're they're cultivating this behind the scenes. But I'm like, I, I smell bullshit, basically. Okay. So two years later, of course, the bullshit came out. Um, they've been planning uh, a, a large scale attack against my mother's people uh, because they were say, the ones that. When, when you say these two countries, for the listeners who are not aware, what two countries Sorry. are you speaking of? So the federal government of Ethiopia uh, had appointed a prime minister that was temporary and was supposed to be there until the elections and then pass on the power. But what ended up happening within the two years uh, of his promise and, and uh, the Nobel Peace Prize was given to him prematurely off of this border opening. I'm like, he's young, what has he done? The border opened and all of a sudden he's being paraded, something's up, right? Um, so he was being paraded as the new leader of democracy. He was gonna you know, bring in this wave of democracy. And within two years, uh, because he wanted to consolidate power and if anybody resisted and exercised their constitutional right, he somehow uh, uh, was using force against them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it went from federal sanctions to all of a sudden there was, after planning an attack between him and uh, uh, the Eritrean dictator, so they both planned a mass uh, attack against Tigray because the Eritrean dictator had his own grievances with them, right? And so with that being said, he found an ally that found a common enemy. And instead it was him, the Eritrean dictator, uh, a faction of the Amhara militia. So they're also a large population within Tigray. We have 83 different ethnicities. Amhara is like 30 million people, wow. right? So within that, there's a militia that's like, you know what? We need to come back into power like Haile Selassie days. Uh, we hate Tigrayans. It wasn't even political, but politics was used as a reason. Uh, they said they wanted to oust the political party. And when they came in, it was them three, plus UAE drones, plus Somali uh, uh, militia, uh, mercenaries, right? So you have four different powers attacking one province of Ethiopia because they felt that they were uh, in the way of whatever agenda that they wanted to have, right? Because if you get rid of us, everything else falls apart, right? Wow. And Tigray has been attacked since Menelik days. When Menelik consolidated Menelik. his power and forced Ethiopia into being, um, he used England and he uh, had a treaty with uh, Italy in order to get arms, the Treaty of Wachale, and he cut Tigray in half because he didn't want Aksum Empire to come and, you know, get their power back. And so Italy took the coast, which is Eritrea, and Tigray became smaller. Then when Haile Selassie came into power, he had England help him out by bombing uh, Tigray mm. and causing a mass starvation thing. And it was oh, wow. mass starvation two times. Wow. Then when uh, the Red Terror came into power with the We Are the World campaign and all that stuff, mass starvation again with Tigray. And now this guy, not even mass starvation, is just horrific, like the rape, the cultural plundering, um, just, I mean, I can't even describe half the stuff that I'm seeing, like being reported underground, um, taking kids, shooting them and throwing them off, uh, cliffs and things, uh, hacking them, not allowing farmers to, to, uh, to plant seeds. Uh, if there's aid coming in, they're burning it. They're mixing it with sand and giving that to the people. Like they're literally, oh, they cut off the, the electricity, the internet, everything. Right. So they're, and they are not allowing to grinds to leave so that they can tell or even get away from it. They're trying to contain them and create this concentration camp within our province. And it's wow. like now we're at 90% of this man-made uh, disaster that's happening. And the women, they're, um, they're sticking nails, hot rods up their uterus. And the oh, reason why they're doing that is because they don't ever want them to give birth to young males who could fight in the future. Can you believe that? So it, wow. it's like, it's, it's really nasty, like what's happening. You know, and desecrating uh, priests, nuns, you know what I mean? Like the rape, is, it's just, it's really to try and get people to, to get on their knees and submit. But even with all this stuff, it's like, I don't know. I don't know what's happening, but I've never thought that for someone who's trying to unite 
both sides because I've always hated the conflict. I've, I've seen it in my family, so I've used music as a way to bring people together. Right, For the first time, I'm actually questioning my Ethiopian identity. And immigration services in Ethiopia has now removed Tigray from the list. So it's like, are we stateless now? I don't right. know. They can't even get uh, immigration services within uh, Ethiopia. So I'm just like, <laughs> wow. Well, well, so that's what's happening. Um, it's not about people. It's about resources. It's about the waterway. That's what's going on. But we're just being, this war is a pawn situation, I think, so, in my opinion. So we, we appreciate you, uh, you know, giving us that report. Um, what I mean, I hate to like, uh, cut it short, but we definitely gonna have you back on on the morning show um, because of the fact that it's a lot of important information that's coming through. What I would like you to do, we invited you on as an artist today, but we can't, <coughs> if everything is political, even if we don't see it as political, whatever. Right. So um, for the folks who are, are not familiar with your art, uh, if you could drop a, uh, you know, drop something on us real quick and um, we're gonna definitely have you back on and we're definitely gonna be supporting your work and efforts. No, no worries, no worries, no worries. The hostage right. in the building. Hit All us right. with something. <laughs> Not even three fifths. Man, they call me African, but they don't even know me because they got it all backwards, man. I am the one that is, but never was a timeless spirit living in this body of mine. I flew over many seas, crossed my feet across the desert sand. I Afro nomadic am in the mind, manifesting the divine. And if I wanted, I could show you how I'm able to shine like. Kuchub, semi star in the sky, but systematically they keep attacking me and my rights, huh? That's cool, just Google Axum, just to let you all know that I got me some roots too. And trust me, they can never suppress me. I'm documented in so many different kind of ways. And like the Moors, I've been there before. All you got is a handprint, because they won't say no more. Ah, the house is in the, the building. House is in the building. Yeah. We definitely appreciate you um, coming on. How can the people contact you? How can they get in touch with your... Uh, and learn more about your work, you know what I mean? Talk to us. Wow, um, I'm on Instagram. Uh, that seems to be the way to go right now. So Rahasit um, underscore is underscore blessed. Um, yeah, so Rahasit, R-E-H-A-S-T-T -E -E underscore is underscore blessed. No doubt, no doubt. We have, we, before you go, uh, we'll be yeah. remiss if we don't have you do the bold question, the mighty ear doctor over there. Oh my God. Who look like who look like he tired, but he's always ready for the, the, the joint. We're gonna let Minister Server go in there and pick for oh you. Oh my gosh. All right, yeah, bring did. it on, bring it on. Woo. Okay, you okay. Know, tell him what he asking. This is that 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 real HBCU connection. I got you, ear doctor. <laughs> name a song, right. name a song that a DJ will play that makes you get on the dance floor. That's a real DJ question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let me clear my throat. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Word. <laughs> Word. DJ Cool. Yeah. Word. We, we, we now, we, yeah. o, only, on, only on Renegade Culture can you go from uh, uh, unrest in Ethiopia and Eritrea <laughs> to, to DJ Cool, <laughs> all in the same 10 minutes. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> No doubt. You know, I just start, you know. <laughs> See, look, she, she, she losing it now. <laughs> Somebody Hip hop, baby. <laughs> can't stop, won't stop. Renegade no culture. Yo, we have to, We appreciate you coming on. We definitely have <laughs> you back on the morning show soon. No doubt. Yeah. Be strong, yeah, and we're going to talk to you in a minute. Tell all our folks all right. in Toronto. Thank you. Black up, man. Thank you. No appreciate doubt. For sure. Tell the folks in Toronto, Rene Renegade culture rule the world. Oh, you, you bet. I'm about to get online right now. How about that? All right. <laughs> All right. No Thank doubt. You. Respect, Salute. sis. Salute. Catch you in a minute. Peace. Peace. Check it out, Renegade Culture. Yeah, man. Yo, man. It's been a heavy-duty show. Heavy, heavy-duty show, man. That was deep what she was talking about with the, what's happening over there in, in Ethiopia, bro. Uh, and, and it's necessary. I mean, it's good that right. uh, we can go from the history of hip-hop to uh, what's going on in the continent because yeah. it's all connected. It's all connected. No indeed, doubt. Indeed, indeed. Uh, shout out to our team out here putting in that work. You know what I'm saying? Um, good job today, uh, Minister Service. Yes, sir. Uh, come on, I'm coming for you. Uh oh. Come on, man. I'm coming for you, bro. Man, good for him. You trying to take his job? Hey, come on now. We we gotta have this. Maybe once a month I come through and show you what it really is. Come oh. on. Man. Oh. Yeah. What's up? What's up? Oh. You, so so you think you got him, man? I'm, I'm... Hey, listen, man. It's a whole different kind of thing here, but you know what it is with us anyway. Okay. Yeah, you know I mean the real hip hop. Okay. Lives here. Renegade culture. Renegade culture. Yeah, yeah. Bo, 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 bo.